Are you okay to with that? Oh, it's like magic. There we go. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, so yes. So, welcome again to the um, uh, this era of meeting. This the intention of this meeting is to look at uh, the EV strategy that we put together back in 2018 or 2017 and published in 2018. Um, uh, with a view to seeing what we need to do to do a bit of a refresh on it, because the intention is that we um, we set out back in the day when we put this together, there were about 80 cars or so, 80 EVs on the road. We set out an ambitious target to try and get a thousand EVs on the road in the five years of the strategy. Um, we are now probably over 600 EVs um, on the road in, in Orkney at the moment. Um, the numbers are a bit vague uh, due to the vagaries of the Office of National Statistics data collection process, um, but we we are on our way, well on our way to get to the, the thousand. So the point is, what are we going to do beyond that? Because the rules have also was well, so the ground has also changed a lot. So the idea is to try and look at the strategy that we've got, um, see what needs to change in the light of your experiences, because this is very much about trying to tap into the knowledge of EV drivers. Um, around the, the county, uh, because quite simply, we, we know best about how uh, things are going for us and our collective experience and the wisdom of the crowd will give us some insight as to what we should be able to do, able to, do to help get to the next stage. And the suggestion is for the next five years, we probably ought to be looking to try and get another, say, 5,000 EVs on, on, the, on Orkney's roads. Mm -hmm. So... So, uh, sorry, Liz, I think you're not muted there. Sorry. It's, um, oh. sorry, sorry. It's, um, so um, what I've got is a short presentation, and I'll, I'll rattle through what we've uh, or intended to cover, 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 if that's all right, if I've got the right teeth in, and we'll see how we go. So, um, just a second. It's not going to work. Give me a second. I'm trying to share working. So I'm going to seek to share my screen. So if somebody could confirm you're seeing my screen, that'd be useful. Yep. I see you, Connie. Excellent. Thank you, Rajendee. Okay. So EVs in Orkney in 2022, and it's really about you know, what now and where are we going next? Um, and so the idea was to have a, a, just set out roughly what we're trying to do, introduction about it, what issues are you having? And there's a piece where we're going to run a thing called Jamboard, which is a, something we've used in other events, which is an online tool which allows people to post up their um, experiences on effectively post-its and we'll try and collect together ideas about that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But a look at the um, envisaged future that we had in the previous uh, document, which was really setting out what we thought the world was going to look like in 2050. Um, but I think we could want to refresh that a bit. Look at the actions of what we said we were going to do, um, and was, we were going to try and get done, and look at what's been completed, what are incomplete, why are they incomplete, etc. And then once again, have another thrash around about what we need to change, what we need to alter, deduct, um, and add to the list. And the intention then to sum up and close with a view to then getting a group of people together at some stage who want to get involved in writing the next bit of the strategy. So just rattling through a few sort of facts and figures about what has happened to date, um, the history of um, the EV policy really started off when in 2013, Transport Scotland produced um, their first Switched on Scotland uh, uh, document, which started to get EVs deployed um, in, in Scotland and in Orkney in particular. That gave rise to the council coming up with its Orkney electric vehicle infrastructure strategy, which gave rise to the first couple of charges turning up in Great Western Road and a couple at, uh, one at the Hope and one at uh, Stromness, and the council taking on their first EV. And OREF then became involved and were interested in what was going on. We ended up producing a document to help charges put in better, which is an infrastructure design guide which circulates to local councils. Um, and in due course, um, Transport Scotland then did a refresh on their document. In 2016, produced the Switched on Scotland, which is a roadmap to, to increase adoption of electric vehicles. In the meantime, um, the 
the energy strategy was also being produced for Scotland as a whole. And at around about this time, we were working separately on a refresh of the EV strategy, um, which we wrote rather than the council writing. And then more recently, there's been a, there's been a blizzard of documents which have happened. So um, climate change strategies, um, a variety of energy documents, heat strategies, and a, and a load of other things have happened. And the point is that the, the game has changed quite significantly and the time has now come to do a refresh on our strategy for, for, for the next five years or so. So what's been happening in terms of, 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 doc, of, of vehicles? I mean, there's been a lot of publicity activity that we've done as a whole for ORF over the years, ranging back from Willie McEwen's EV, which was at the county show in the top left-hand corner, and the, the hydrogen car with Gareth and the green one, the second one in on the top left, down to us um, writing no CO2 and sending that to the previous COP, so COP20, whatever it was, back in Paris, um, and a load of events in the meantime, which have sought to increase publicity, including a fairly young looking Jonathan Porterfield uh, driving from um, John O'Groats to Land's End and back again in a, in a leaf. Um, and really, a lot of things have changed in that time. You know, since we've been doing this bit of work, I, I would suggest there are several significant changes that have gone on in what's happening in the infrastructure. Um, and the progress, I would argue, is that we've seen. Jeremy, can you mute your mic, please? So, um, one of the things that we've seen is that the philosophy behind installing charges has changed quite a lot for the council, in as much as originally there was a plan to sort of spread them quite evenly across the county, but actually we realised that it's better to put them in, in hubs and cluster them in certain ways. We've also seen there's a variety of models has increased dramatically with the number of cars um, uh, in Orkney. Now, with something like 140 different models available to, to buyers. So there, there's a huge range in the types of cars that are available. And the other big thing that's also happened has been sort of the normalisation of, of, of EVs. So the picture on the left-hand side was at the old academy showing a bunch of EVs, and there's, I think there's a, there's a non-EV in there. But the one on the right was particularly telling. I think Mark took on Palace Road and he just parked his car and walked away and looked back and realised that four out of the five cars in, in that outside the cathedral were actually EVs. And that wasn't set up shop, that was just life. So there's a sort of significant change that's, that has been going on and Orkney's very much been leading the way in it. Um, and in terms of the vehicles that are in Orkney, um, it's, it's, I think it's illuminating um, to, uh, to see what's, what's happening uh, with, with a number of vehicles. Um, we did some work with DVLA some time ago, um, which looked at, did an analysis on what are the types of cars that are actually in the county. And um, we've really been focusing very much on, on, on cars themselves. Um, and this graph shows the, the date at which all of the cars in Orkney in 2018 were registered. So in 2017, it's showing a smallish bar. The largest bar there is in, say, 2014. And, and then it goes on as a bit of a dip. But you can see effectively what happens is that cars in 2018, some of them um, were still in, were, were, were on the road originally in 1991, but the vast majority of them um, were the same sort of numbers of cars were, were put onto the roads roughly every year, which is somewhere in the region of a thousand car mark. And at about 2005, we then start to see things tailing off and really a significant scrappage of vehicles happening um, when the cars are, are, are that sort of old. And that is quite um, illuminating because it shows that um, the, 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 the cars we got on the road will, will turn over and change of, of their own volition because people will be scrapping their cars. If you look what's going to happen with electric vehicles, that, oops, that could be quite quite different because you see an end of petrol vehicles from sort of, I think 2030 or so. Um, and so we're going to see uh, predominantly green fueled vehicles on the roads, but the, the diesel and petrol cars are not going to be off the roads um, for, for some years to come. But we may also see um, that actually EVs may well last longer so they'll lead to scrappage later, and there may be new, fewer new vehicles on the road every year to end up with the same number of vehicles in total. We're not quite sure how that's going to go, but there are there are changes going on there. 
The other thing is it's worth looking at what, what could be happening and looking at other markets. And these are a couple of figures from Norway, which I think is quite telling, showing the change and um, in the types of fuels that are, be, are in vehicles that are being put onto the roads now. And the graph on the left hand side, it shows the types of the fuels of vehicles which were put on the road in 2020 through to 2021. And the little sliver at the top is showing what's left of the number of petrol vehicles that are there and, and the growth of battery electric vehicles sort of dominating the space. So it's quite reasonable to expect that that's precisely what's going to happen in the UK in due course. Oh, great, yeah. Mark, can you just mute people down, please? Yeah, Charles. Um, so, so, there's, so, that, so we can see what is actually going to be happening on, on the market in the, um, uh, in, in, the, in the EV market as, as that we can expect to see that's going to happen in Orkney. So um, we also know quite quite clearly that electrification is, is actually going to be coming here. As we said, that we've got 150 or so models on uh, available to people to buy at the moment. We've got over 600 on, on the roads. We could be expecting to see another 5,000 in the next five years, taking us to around about 6,000. Um, and the point is that it's not just cars that we're going to see electrified, but it's going to be vans, motorbikes caravans, you name it, there's going to be an awful lot of electrified equipment. But a proposed for this exercise, we just stick very much to, to um, road traffic as opposed to trying to cover everything like uh, planes and drones and farm machinery, because that would be a bit too complicated. And the point is that so this document is really just for electric vehicles on our roads. Um, and the question is, what do we really need to be ready? What do we have to do? What does Orkney have to do? To be ready to take these extra vehicles onto the roads and be able to, to handle it. So, as always, ORF is very keen to know what, what we can actually do to help make this happen because it's not just a case of the council ought to do it. There will be actions on the part of all of us that, that need to happen, not just the people who are in the room, but we need to explain to people who have yet to think about electric vehicles what would be the right thing to do and are there ways in which we can help people make this transition as easily as possible. So first stage, the first exercise uh, this evening is I want to look at what are the issues? Um, because what I'd like to understand or to get out on, on in public is something about understanding the issues that we as EV drivers are actually having. We also want to know what works well um, and also understand that on, at some degree of granularity. So is it about charge points the problem? Is the car performance okay? How is the charge by Scotland back office? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Are there particular messages or themes that we could pick out of our experiences that would help other people come along? Um, and indeed, there'll be other things that you'll think of that I haven't jotted down in here. And the point is, what we're now going to do is use the the Jam board. Hopefully, this should all work, which will be a means by which we will allow will help people um, put up little post-its onto onto a board. Now, um, the web address is here, and like an idiot, I haven't loaded this properly on my computer. So give me just two seconds while I get myself sorted out. We'll post that link into the chat so that people can then uh, pick that up. So bear with me a second while I just ruin what I've just been doing. Just while you're doing that, Neil, it's great to see that you're getting into the IT world in such an integrated way. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you for such an illuminating talk so far. <laughs> you can be my interlude music, Gareth. Thank you, Richard. Like that. Okay. Could somebody check and see whether that, that link is work? I think I, I should have. Yeah, it's it there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, getting in? Excellent. Could if anybody can't, please say, because we did have a bit of a problem last time because um, I hadn't set the permissions entirely correctly. So if you just bear, if anybody can't get in, please come off mute and shout about it. So, um, uh, I'm, so it's Jack Drever here. I, I'm not in, I can't, I can't see how to get in. So did, did you click on the link, Jack, in the, in the chat? Aha. I'm clicking on it, nothing's happening. Has it opened in another tab in your browser? Good point. Because we're now getting to the edge of my IT knowledge, I tell you. <laughs> we're now really another problem. 
Well, 17 people are in there, so that's a good start. So, uh, that's it. Yep. so if while you're grappling with it, if I could just talk to the others and let, let them uh, crack on. Effectively, what we've got, there are four pages I've got here. The first one being what works. The second page, if you click at the, the box at the top of two or four, the second page is, is about what is not working. The third page is really about what's missing and what we got wrong. And we'll come to that really in the strategy as a whole. And then the fourth one is really uh, random stuff that we haven't definitely thought about. So it's a chance to capture random thoughts and bits and pieces that need to be, uh, be jotted down. So what I'd like to do is to, so some people have got the hang of this already. Um, you'll see that if you click on the extreme left-hand side, there is a little picture underneath the, the big black arrow, the, big, the black circle with the white arrow in it. That there is um, a like a post-it. If you click on that, um, it will open up a chance for you to put uh, some notes in it, um, and you can then post up your thoughts if you've got any. Um, similarly, if you have got other thoughts and you want to put them in the chat instead, we can do that. We'll try and assemble those later on. But the idea is to try and find out um, what is actually working um, well and also the next page is um, what doesn't work. So I'm just going to move these out of the way so people can just see what's going on. And we haven't, haven't sort of grouped these yet. We'll have a look at this as we go. If anyone wants to talk about any things that are good or bad um, as a bit of an interlude for a couple of minutes, then feel free to do so. Um, can I just jump in there, Neil, since you um, offered yeah, sure. the invitation? Um, just one that I was saying, um, I put a post-it note up for, was for uh, people like myself who might be on the vanguard, who have an EV but don't have and cannot have a charger at home. Um, I think, you know, that particular kind of segment of the of, of, of people, um, which I'm one of, I'm sure there are others, is something we need to be addressed. I've got some ideas about that. I'm going to put them on the post-it notes, but I think that's something we might want to think about. Yes, it, it, it definitely is. Um, and I think the one of the pieces I expect will develop tonight is that, that regarding it, regarding EV drivers needs as monolithic is a mistake. So basically pretty much everybody gets their petrol at a petrol station with the possible exception of farmers who might have a, have, have a tank at, 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 the, at the home basically, but near 95% of people I expect actually charge uh, will get petrol that way. That's not gonna be the case with EV drivers. There will be some diversity. Um, and it'll be probably driven by where you live more than anything else. So I think that's absolutely right. Oh, so somebody started, somebody started scrolling with a pen as well. That's different, I like that. Okay. Uh, that, that was me trying to, trying to get into the uh, post <laughs> That's all right. That's all right, Jack. So we'll let you off. I, I thought it was your, I thought it was your Banksy moment. So there you go. <laughs> So what I'm going to suggest is we'll, if we just talk through a couple of these and see what's here at the moment. Um, and um, if people do want to do any grouping or feel the, feel the urge to organise it, those people who are used to doing this sort of stuff, then feel free and pile in. That's a bit worrying. Everything's just disappeared off my bloody screen. So I don't know what I'm there. There's a new page in it, Neil. There's a new page one, so you have to go to page two to get page one. Oh, that's all right. Uh, is it? No. Is it? No, I think page... Yeah, I've now got five pages and there were four before. Okay. No, my, my page one is now filled up with all the pieces again, so I know what the hell, hell happened there. I'm just going to be calm and try and try and see what's here. Mm. So Be calm and carry on. Yes, yeah. So, um, do we want to talk through any of these at the moment? Or let's see, we've got a couple about um, reflex has caught my eye, reflex initiatives, added momentum, local service capability to EV movements, and the, the, the reflex rental offer makes EV ownership more affordable. I'm going to put those 
two together for a second. Um, Jonathan Porfield gets a name check, he's a champion of the sector. If I find that's his initials on that, they'll be in trouble. Um, um, we've got a bit about charge points seem to be being, oh no, I put that up, ignore that one. Um, good network of numerous charges in Orkney, usually a backup charger close by in case of one being, uh, one being down. Um, what's working well, OREF is a pressure group. What worked well until now, EV servicing capacity that has been validated by the EV manufacturers. Um, home charging with three pin charger works well for us, Orkney driving. Um, charge points seem to have settled down to work properly. I've heard talk about reducing the number of charge points. This is worrying. It's not about efficiency of chargers, but always about having one more than needed. Um, EVs without a charger at home, so reliance solely on public chargers, which are very expensive and short. Can we have longer, sort of lower, longer charging for specific postcodes? Last charge by Scotland, question mark. Uh, confidence gained from seeing and speaking to others who have made the transition. Work, um, what's working well, better, larger battery EVs has almost eliminated the need for the use in public chargers um, on Orkney as a resident. Longer charging on some destinations, e.g. Houghton to allow a trip to Hoy um, or Kirkwall overnight. Um, I'm going to clump, I'm going to put that one with the other one about longer, slower charging, because I think that's the same sort of issue, but, but feel free to argue against me. Island scale works well for EV use in terms of distance. Public chargers on the mainland work well. I'm going to move that to the charge point seem to have settled down properly, put those two together. Um, well suited for Orkney with good range of charging points and home chargers now. EBs are common here, which supports uptake. Can we have peer-to-peer -peer charging? So offer and book private chargers at people's home and they are paid for this. So quite a good variety of comments there, I think, um, on that. We're, this is not a closed office, so people, people feel free to add to stuff later on. Um, and I'm going to see what's on the, what's not working. Uh, can be, oops, um, needs, <laughs> every time I read one, somebody's moving out of the way, I'm going to start the other end, so hang on. A um, few public charges on the outer aisles, if any, that's, which is a point that I want to develop in a minute. Um, aisles have been left out by EV for EV charging, so a couple of aisles related points there. Cost of electric vehicles is still high for most households. Charge Post Scotland is still not working well. It's hit and miss whether you are mailed after using a charger. A lot of downtime on chargers, hard to get access to some of the cheapest EV tariffs. Cost of electricity rising could add significantly could add significant cost to charging. Needs to be needs to be some flexibility to stay or to sort of stay time. Picky centre um, has allowed before penalties. Too short to watch a film. Still need still need the gut feeling that the charges will one hundred percent work when you arrive. Random charging schedule for CPS and erroneous charging. Yeah, can be tricky to do the maths and work out how much charges cost. Many people don't use kilowatts. Um, servicing for cars not always possible on island, especially with warranty. Um, local maintenance of charges needed not working well. A9 trunk road is rapids are not reliable. No maintenance on public charges. So I, th there will be others to add on that, but I think there's quite a range of stuff there as well between, so there's the island piece, which I've definitely got some slides on later on, um, bit on the chargers, mm -hmm. um, certainly sort of the time to be on chargers is an issue. Um, and there's something about that as well later as well. So point is opportunity to capture more thoughts about this. Please do put other things on as you, as you, as you um, see them. Meantime, I'm gonna carry on um, with some slides and talk about more of the other pieces that, that are going. Um, now, this is really interesting. I have seem to have got a load of arrows and stuff all over my screen. Have I actually drawn on my screen? I don't know what's happened there. That's really weird. Anyway, what's uh, the other uh, Neil, no, that was me accidentally while trying to get onto the post-it notes. D d don't worry. Somehow you seem to have managed to put it on my screen, which is the bit I really don't understand, Jack. So that's that's 
That's a first. So there you go. I'm going to. Incompetence is a skill. Okay, well, I'm going to stop sharing and then come back in again and hope it's gone away. So let's see what happens. So. Um, let's try this again. Hurrah. Okay, it's all right. You're in the clear, Jack. I'm not coming to find you. Right. Um, so. So we talked about all the issues. Um, so, um, so I want to talk now about the last strategy. So the last strategy you say was drafted very much by EV uh, drivers from Orkney and was public consul publicly consulted upon and then finally published in 2018. Um, it was accepted and commended by the council, not actually adopted, but it was, it, but it was broadly accepted. Um, and there were 45 actions that we proposed in, in the, the strategy. Um, and so the question really is, how well did we do? And the next bit, I just want to look at that. And this is my assessment. I'm happy to be pushed and shoved around on this if necessary. But the first thing we did in it was we had what we called an envisioned future in 2018. And the envisioned future, and I'll talk through that in a second, was that by 2050, it was anticipated there wouldn't be fossil fuel vehicles on, the, on all these roads other than vintage specimens. They wouldn't all be electric. Some might be hydrogen, some might be fuel cells, some might be internal combustion engines running on synthetic fuels. We reckon that most EVs would charge at home, in the street, at work, or in charge parks, which are essentially cabled up car parks at the present locations. We reckon that EVs will have a greater bas battery capacity um, then than they had back in 2018, um, or at least a greater range requiring less frequent charging than cars needed back in 2018, but very few will be hybrid. We reckon that some vehicles will be in joint ownership and transport will be seen more as a service than a capital investment. Um, so this is where things like Uber and self-driving vehicles will, will probably be coming in. Um, and we may also there see, therefore see fewer vehicles parked on the roads because they might be in use by other people rather than just being sitting around park. But traffic levels might actually increase slightly if these things are rattling all over the place to go to the next job. But, we, but it's, we're not quite sure how that would all work out. We knew our towns are going to be quieter, our air quality and water quality would be better because there'd be less oil and, and crap um, coming out of cars. Um, and we knew that less money was going to leave the islands to pay for fuel and the Orkney electricity supply would be entirely supplied by renewables and storage. And at the time, there was a Scottish government target for 40% of new cars and vans to be registered um, by 2032, being ultra low emission. So the key words in that lot, I've sought to highlight very, very much about not all vehicles being electric, 2050 was the target point. Um, the EVs charging at home will have greater battery capacity, joint ownership, not sure about traffic levels, um, and the would have a renewables dominated system. And the gov government target was 40% of vehicles by 2032. And certainly those two dates, have, I, I would suggest, have changed significantly since we thought about this back in 2017 18. And the 2050 has now moved dramatically further forward. And I would suggest we're now looking at vehicles pretty much being fully, that was. Um, being pretty much fully electrified by, by 2040, 2030 maybe. And certainly not 40% of new cars by 2032 being ultra low emission and now saying basically pretty much 100%. So do we think that that envisaged future is about right? Has anybody got any thoughts about anything that's dramatically missing from there? I think vehicle to grid or vehicle to home will be a significant player in the future as more manufacturers are looking at not just Chalimo DC vehicle to home, but also there's lots of businesses looking at um, AC. So I think the car will change from what's commonly known as a means of transport and something to prize and be possessed, but it can have a significant use with regard to balancing the grid. I'm convinced of that. So it's a mobile battery storage device that that uh, hopefully will more than likely have a financial benefit to the person. There will be a financial incentive to plug in at certain times and just help the, the grid. Yeah, OK, that's a fair point. We're silent on that, Jonathan, that's a fair point. Any any other comments or anything else that anybody thinks? Gareth, go. Yeah, maybe just a kind of faster and further 
piece. I mean, it seems like a, it's always great when we look back at these things that we've said before, and you know, it's heartening that we've got most of it right. I think in terms of direction of travel, uh, the thing that might change is the pace. And I guess that in in the climate change world, um, I think for me one of the heartening things is that although we've got a time scale that's set at the moment, we're every time we readjust the curve we time we accelerate things rather than decelerate things because the urgency is seen as even more so um that that's maybe a, a thought that it's not just what we think might be the target but then actually suggesting that those targets are probably going to be accelerated because you know the the crisis will will grow in the short term um as, as I say that, I was, I was just thinking about the whole COVID thing and, you know, like you, you get put in lockdown and then it's not as bad as you think it was told at the beginning. But that's because there's been a bit of success because the lockdown actually stopped you having the outcome that you were warned about at the start. So there is going to be, with climate change, maybe we're going to go further and it isn't going to be such a good outcome, even if we manage to control it. But I guess we need to be wary that, you know, if we are successful at early adoption, that we... Um, we still see it through because people don't suddenly perceive that things are getting better. Yeah. Okay. So, so it feels that there's something there about making sure that we're also ready and able to flex and go harder and faster. So to have a, an acceleratable program if we need it, um, that, that could be important. It feels very unlikely it's, it's gonna slow down. It, yeah. that, that doesn't feel the direction of movement at the moment, as far as I can see. Okay. Any other thoughts on the on the envisioned future? I think Gareth again. Yeah, just one other thing that popped into my head there was about you know we we've, we've talked about Orkney. If we do go further and faster, we can become um, you know a place where things are trialed in that journey. So maybe the, the possibility of the living laboratory lighthouse community concept being applied specifically to transport. Milton Keynes got quite a lot of publicity you know, recently was it where they were going to be taking their footballers to and from the training ground on autonomous vehicles. Um, yeah, be interesting to see what role we have. Yeah, okay. Laura? Yeah, um, I just want to pick up what Gareth said and what um, also Jonathan just said about EVs as batteries and the self-determination, the way in which it enable us as EV drivers and EV drivers in Orkney to be able to support the grid and also potentially also support um, our local wind turbines or our island turbine, our island trusts ha have wind turbines. So that, that intimate relationship seems quite important. And of course, but in order for that to happen and for that relationship to be established, and I put a note, um, a post-it note on the board, we're probably as EV drivers might need to know what's going on on the grid. Because if I want to go, yep, I want to, you know, now's the time for me to go charge my car. I need to know that now's the time for me to charge my car. And I know that there, you know, there's flexible flexibility within the system if you're charging at home. But again, I'm, I'm thinking ahead to people who literally don't have that option. They're going to have to literally go out and plug their car at a specific time. And at least having that information gives people kind of choices. So that relationship between car you know the car the battery as storage which is in potentially important for us in, in orkney and our self-determination with the grid and then the information the data getting to people to be able to make them that choice so there feels like pieces that can be joined up to make this all happen yeah okay thanks laura that's an interesting thought uh jonathan you're next yeah i want to back up what laura said some cracking points i think human behavior has really interested me with evs over the years and it, it's got a, this sort of transition and making them, you know, plug the vehicle in while it's windy. The human nature is that people just won't do it. They're too preoccupied with the Sainsbury's shop and the kids and, and office work. But if we can get to a state where, where the car is parked, it is plugged in, be it AC, DC or whatever, or at home, and that is connected to the grid and that all happens automatically, then I think that's probably where the future will be, hopefully. Okay. Okay. Out. And then, and then, Jonathan, you've set your hand up again. Okay. Glut for punishment. Go, on, Gareth. So, other people are able to chip in as well. By the way, so, yeah. no. Well, like this is a great line that Laura started off actually, and um, 
I'm going to be even more optimistic than Jonathan and say, well, if you did get the ping and, and the ping told you, you could go and earn yourself 10 quid by going and plugging your car in because they were going to need it in a couple of hours time, you might get out of your pit and go and take your car to the charge point and get the money for that. So I think that that democratization of that service, if you, if you haven't got that charge point exactly at your home, would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously that would, the, the, the system that Laura's talking about would then link to your home as well. So it would be an integrated energy system app. It wouldn't just be your vehicle um, that you'd be looking at. And yeah, okay, Mike. Yeah, I'm just um, supporting, I suppose, what Jonathan and Laura and Gareth have been saying there, but maybe look at it from the other side. I, I think the human nature thing that um, people are going to have to get up and go and do something is, is going to be difficult. And also understanding, uh, you know, if my car is charging out or sending its charge to the grid, will I be able to drive it? You know, that, that's going to be a problem, I think. But one of the things that might help that is to make sure that wherever the car is parked, there's some way of plugging it in. And the car has got to be parked somewhere, and that's got to be a space um, where you could theoretically put a socket. Yeah. And uh, maybe that is the, the focus that we should be going for. Yeah, it's an interesting one, Mike. And it says a few things have been going on, um, certainly with Reflex, that we, we've started to try and break out of, of that bit about having just charge spaces but having car park spaces which have got chargers, which I think is that point you're talking about there, that you know, make them ubiquitous. And the, and the principal difference um, is that the, ch the chargers put in by the council have got communications that are quite sophisticated, and they've got about £17,000 for, for a post with two plugs on it. We've been putting the chargers in at the old academy, and they cost just about £1,000 each, as opposed to £17,000. So you can obviously put, you know, you put 17 in for the price of two sockets. So I think there, there are certain advantages in going down that route of, of, uh, of flooding an area with, with chargers. So yeah, I think that's an interesting model. Gareth, and then I'm gonna move on to the next bit. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking is to, to deliver all of this, we need a system that, like an electrical distribution system that's there to provide the service, rather than us being customers that are there to serve the system. And um, so if we're gonna deliver this, we need perhaps a new form of governance <clears throat> of the existing grid system that makes it much more aligned with the needs of the end users. Um, I'll leave it as an open question about who can deliver that and whether our incumbent could manage to do that. But I think we should set out the goals that we need a much more flexible energy el electricity distribution system that could then react to these needs. Okay. All right, so yeah, we can pick that. Yes, I think we can we, weave something in there. Okay. All right, so I've made notes of those points. So we'll, we'll, try, we'll, we'll pick up those points and look to, to weave that in. So, okay. So, so we, I, I would argue that we weren't that far out with what we put forward um, in, in uh, 2018, and we seem to be on the right sort of track generally. Um, um, so, what I wanted to do was to look now, and you don't worry about reading this, we're going to go to this in a bit more detail in a second, but look, look at the big letters on the right hand side, Jonathan, with the colours, that's right. Um, the, um, uh, we've, we've basically, of those 40 odd actions, I've sort of broken those down and had a look at them and see what's going on, but basically 13 or so I reckon were pretty successfully implemented or started or, or work in progress or made some real effort. 12 have had some activity, but it's been insufficient. Two haven't started, and 18 don't believe there's been any particular progress, or indeed they may have been overtaken by events and we don't need to do these things anymore. So I'm now going to look at these pieces and just quickly talk through them and see what we what we think and whether we agree that, that, that there was a progress, because I think it's important we've got something of a scorecard to show how we got on before we embark on the next one. So in terms of the ones that were successfully completed or started, um, the, the, um, and these are my assessments, so I'm happy to be uh, challenged on them. The first one was really about the council to consider its exit strategy for um, running charges, because there's, there's no way that a council should be necessarily the fuel provider in the, in the 2050s. And, and I know the council are keen to get out of this when they can. Um, and I know there've been some discussions around that, uh, the possibility of doing that at some point. Um, the bit about producing and circulating information to community councils on the likely charging needs of halls, 
we did produce a note for community councils about that, which basically said, don't bother. Um, the community halls are not the best place to charge. There are other better ways of doing it, but I'm not sure that's necessarily got too much lift there. There was a proposal about an island um, a car club model should be piloted. And in fact, the Reflex project um, has started that pretty with the car provided by CES through the Reflex project at um, uh, Kirkwall, which I know is used by Shappensey uh, residents who come in and others. Um, but there are, the, but that has started. So there's some work gone on there. Um, the bit about the owner of the service of charging, that was a bit of an orphan activity in the council, but it was then replaced with uh, the roads team and they, they've, they've taken that on and done a good job in maintaining the charges. Um, the EV charge, the, the infrastructure guide, that really did get adopted. So the things we put forward are, have been done, which is good. They're painting the right sort of lines, putting the signs at the right place and all that sort of business. Um, largely working there. Well, they just sometimes have to wade through a puddle to get there, but that's another story. Um, the critical parts are being held uh, locally um, and warranty options taken up on new infrastructure. So the warranty options were definitely taken up because they weren't being taken up five years ago. They have happened, but there is a problem in that the bit about critical parts being locally held, that's not succeeded. And that's still not happening at the moment. So that's a bit slightly messy, that one. The charging on charging, charging for charging process, i.e. introducing fees, we pushed really hard for that and that was implemented, and um, we'll talk more about that in a second, very successfully. The charging signs are updated um, largely, they're getting updated again. Um, the logging of mileages to see what's going on, that didn't happen particularly successfully, but getting information out of the council extensively, we've got some. Um, but more recently, the Reflex project is now doing work on that and collecting uh, data on, on what's going on. So we have more intelligence being gathered on how cars are being used and the CO2 savings. Um, the idea about exploring more options for data gathering and data mining, there's, that happened a little bit through Reflex and other things, but we haven't really made any inroads into seeking to try and uh, get the public sector to investigate the the travel patterns of staff to better understand the provision that's needed. In other words, could, could people charge at home? Do they have to charge at the office? Dot, dot, dot. So that's some work on that, but not a lot. The project to look at flexible um, and dynamic charging, once again, Reflex has looked at that and is working on some stuff there. So that seems to be going on um, in partly through SMS, partly through Community Energy Scotland. Um, and there's some work has gone on as well outside of the Reflex project as well, which is good. Um, the R&D side of things, we promoted that pretty heavily, which gave rise to the Reflex project. And then, um, pleased to say the count, so the hospital did actually put uh, charges in at the hospital and have got ducts and various things in and have adopted a sensible model of putting charges in the car parks, not in weird places, as was proposed originally. So I think that's, that's not a bad score. Does anybody want to fight back on any of those? Say uh, that that's an in, inaccurate assessment of what they've seen happen? If not, we'll push on. And we say, well, this is not a one-off time, but I'll just rattle through what we've got. In terms of some activity, I don't think there's really been enough. Um, there was a strong proposal that there should be a DC, you know, those are ultra rapid charging hubs in two principal locations, one in Stromness and one in Kirkwall. The Kirkwall one being Great Western Road and, and the Stromness one being on Ferry Road down by the, um, the co-op. Um, and the, the strong suggestion was that they should at least be safeguarded in planning policy to have them available to then be used at a later date um, when and if that became the charging model that went on. Um, we've seen some work at Great Western Road, but not really the planning safeguarding side of things, which still seems to be a bit, um, a bit of a risk. Um, landowner um, approaching landowners about installing charges did do some approaches, but once again, it was a bit piecemeal. Um, the tourist accommodation offering on the Isles, a little bit of work was done on that, but more work is going on at the moment. And also, interestingly, the grants for charges are now being more targeted towards um, uh, B and B's um, and holiday accommodation, which and that that change in philosophy starts in March. So there is likely to be an increase in accommodation providers being able to provide these as, as standard or normal offering. Um, the uh, charge, uh, putting charges on the Aberdeen Shetland boats 
Um, that's been held up by the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, but Northlink have indicated they're keen to do so. The MCA have actually published a draft guidance note on this at last, um, which is the precursor to providing the guidance that would be able to um, enable Northlink to fit charges. They're also putting some charges in at the keys at, at either end, which probably won't get used as much, but that does seem to be making some progress, but it's not held up by any of you here. It's the joys of the MCA. Um, traffic regulation orders and charging mechanisms, they've, they've partly been sorted out, but they seem to be at the bottom of a very long list in school place at the moment and unfortunately haven't received the attention that it really needs. So with one of the points made on things that we have, the problems we're having, i.e. The, the period before the overstay charges kick in is too short at the moment. So probably four hours would make sense on non-rapid charges. So you could plug it in, in the morning, move the car at lunchtime, as opposed to plug it in the morning, rush out an hour before you finish at lunchtime and have to move the thing around and the point about the picking, et cetera. So there needs to be some more work on that. Capital have agreed to do it, but haven't actually executed it yet. Um, these, the charge points on holiday accommodation, that really fits in with the earlier point about holiday accommodation and some of that's happening. Um, OIC to work with high trans and engage on the five issues. I can't remember what the five issues were. That's stupid of me. I wrote that down somewhere. Um, so I'll come back to that one. I can't remember what the hell it was in the, in the notes. Um, oh, press for alternative fuel buses uh, through Transport Scotland. Well, the council did try and get uh, electric buses um, and other buses into the bus contract, but uh, they didn't get any tenders for it. So they tried, were unable to do it, ended up with Cat 6 diesels but do have the rights to substitute buses in um, at a later date if the funding can be found to substitute them. So I think the council did a reasonable job under the circumstances, but have been unable to actually make that happen. And the, the alternative was no buses at all, which didn't seem sensible. Um, we sought to offer a national charge of a charging pilot scheme, but basically Transport Scotland have not been particularly organised or motivated in that direction. So that's, and people have gone off in different directions on that, which is a bit of a mistake. But a lot of people have followed the lead that we insisted upon, which is no charge for connection and, 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 and differential charges for rapids and non-rapids. So that seems to have been adopted by people following us rather than a pilot. Um, the comms issue around charge points has been a continuous running sore, um, but whether that's being resolved at the moment, I'm not quite sure. Martin may have some more information on that, but we're still working on that. And getting data from the existing chargers to determine optimum data flow, that's still a bit of a mess. Um, there is some movement on that. And we've also got, we have got some data courtesy of the council, which I'll show in a second. And then draw up a, um, a plan with the identified parties about all these things and seek a seek commitment to execute it. We sort of got agreement on a lot of these actions, but unfortunately some of them didn't really get onto people's proper work lists. If anyone wants to push back on any of those, fair enough. If not, I'll rattle on. The couple that really got nowhere was improving the accuracy of mapping um, because there's a plethora of maps being developed. That's got absolutely nowhere and it's still a complete dog's breakfast at the moment. There are some, um, we, we found a way into some of it and we're trying to work at it through the Electric Vehicle Association in Scotland, but it's still terrible. Um, and also there was a piece about the council auditing all its current plans and identify planning measures to be undertaken. And I don't think that happened, but that might happen in due course. And then finally, there's a group of stuff that never didn't really get anywhere and hasn't nothing much has happened. On street charging, um, picking up Laura's point or sort of the, the car court type stuff. Um, I don't think anything happened about attracting anybody in for a project for that. Um, the island model for the delivery of charging infrastructure, we'll talk about that more in a second, but that was principally about focusing mainly on domestic charging on the outer aisles because there isn't as much need for high-powered high chargers. We'll cover that in a second. Uh, that covers on the bit about the island opportunities as well, really with the Council of Marine Services. Um, given the interaction that island residents have with the ferry service, is there something intelligent that can be done about whether people leave cars when they get on ferries or could we encourage people to leave cars and not take the cars on the ferries, thereby 
uh, helping mobility if you knew there was a car at the other end. So that's something that's happened a little bit through reflex, but hasn't necessarily got particularly strong engagement with the um, uh, with the rest of the marine services estate. Um, the second version of the charging infrastructure guide um, that didn't happen and probably is now overtaken by events. Um, working to train sufficient people. I know there was work and the the oh, I don't know, EBP. What's it? Business partnership, educational business partnership. We're doing some work on charge on teaching people about car maintenance, uh, EV maintenance, but I'm not sure that's been taken up by the council by the college. Um, the roads and ferries to bring people uh, to Orkney are provided with with charging infrastructure. There was a comment earlier about the means to get up and down the A9 is not adequate yet, uh, or and or other roads. Um, build EV tourism as a market segment at a destination Orkney. That doesn't seem to be particularly taken up, but might be being driven more by the fact that everybody's going to be driving an EV soon, rather than just going after the, the EV anoraks. Car rental model and, um, and also about taxis. We basically said, wait and see what happens on that. But I don't think there's been much significant progress, certainly in Orkney, about it. But there might be because there, we know that the certainly taxi companies are interested but haven't, haven't really seen much motion, motion on that yet. Um, coach, coach provision um, about destination charging. Once again, that might have moved on a bit because if coaches are coming to Orkney, they're probably going to get charged at their depot at night rather than hoping they can get a charge when they turn up in Bursi. So it's likely that that's probably moved on a bit now. Uh, travel records, don't think any effort happened there within the public sector. Um, changing the dc charging software um so that rapid stop after 60 minutes that was an idea i don't think that's probably got much uh, lift anymore i'm not sure um, producing a purchasing guide for all evs um didn't specifically do that but then reflex came along and the work that's been put out by jonathan with youtube and and others i think it's probably over that's probably rather overtaken by events but this that was an idea back then um, attractive vehicle to grid project supplier. Well, we tried a little bit through reflex, but then that didn't get anywhere. So that didn't happen, but it feels as though it's still a thing. Um, and then plan for the uptake of EVs and vehicle to get grid through the installation of ducts in car parks. Um, that's not happened at the innovation campus, um, but it is now likely to become a building regulation requirement that's coming in. So it's coming in through different routes. So not through our efforts, but happened through others. Autonomous vehicle under review. Yeah, well, I think we've reviewed it, but nothing really seems to have moved here that much. And then the Internet of Things project demonstration we offered to Charles Place Scotland um, about some communication problems. Once again, I don't think anything happened there. And then finally updating the strategy two years ago. So we didn't do that, but we've um, but we're at it now. Gareth, go. You're on mute, Gareth best way I know for you. Um, yeah, brilliant, Neil, brilliant run through. Um, I mean, you've kind of said it yourself in a number of these not believed to have been worked on, as you've described it, you actually described quite a bit of work that has been done. And I, um, I, I'm, I just, I'm not yeah. sure whether there's a strategic advantage in, in suggesting that it hasn't been done, but it feels as though there's probably more progress there than um, you're indicating it may only move them to the amber ones rather than the green, but I, I, fair I, point. I, yeah, yeah, okay. And, and other people might be able to fill in some of the gaps, but I think what you described suggests some of these should be orange, not green. Fair um, point. So, so, Evelyn. Yeah, I just think that um, you know. Uh, OIC and marine services have enabled sort of um, EV public EV charging on the island of ED at the pier. Um, so again, while it's not a, a sort of robust uh, analysis of all the islands, I think you know they should they should be recognised and commended for that. Um, and they also enabled sort of the the charger that is dedicated to the car club at Kirkwall Pier, um, which you'd, you'd mentioned earlier on. So yeah. No, entirely take that, Adrian. That, that, thanks. Um, so happy to revise this list. I say this was just my rough cut on stuff um, and happy to get this tweaked. So, um, yeah, good. If, if we can sieve out any other pieces that um, we think are straws in the wind where things may have happened or 
overtake by events or passively happened, or indeed we know things are coming down the track. I think it would be useful to do that. Gary? Could, could you just circulate over the slide to us so we could fill in any thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll find a way to do that. Um, we'll, um, we'll put it somewhere. So yeah, we'll do that. So get people to contribute to it. Okay, so, so the point is that that was a sort of the assessment or the you know, rough cut of how we do it. And I think basically what it comes down to is um, not bad. You know, there's a, quite a few things that have moved there. Very few have been have completely uh, bombed. One or two have are now probably overtaken by events and we were slightly out on. Uh, so I think the things like, say, the coaching charging model is probably one that is, is probably wrong now of coaches possibly charging at various remote locations as they go on their journey. Um, that's probably moved on a bit. And similarly, buses are likely to char charge at depot and are unlikely to have to charge on their route because that's more likely to be a, a bit of a, a, a risky process for, for, for that. So anyways, so I think we can give that a bit of a birthday. Um, so I just want to talk about a couple of things that are particularly uh, relevant at the moment and just share with you a couple of things. One, I think we should be quite proud of what happened about the charging for charging because this was very much something that came out of when we lobbied really hard to make this work and in 29 it was introduced and the graph on the right shows several charges oh. and the um the columns show the number of charges and charge sessions that were happening in the different periods so april 17 to march 18 the amber is April 18 to April 19, and then um, May 19 onwards. And the point is that charging was introduced in May, and you can see how the usage of those charges dropped dramatically. But we've also know that the number of EVs recruited onto the road has not slowed down. So the point was it pushed people away from charging on public infrastructure to um, charging um, at home, and it made it freed up the charges to the people who really need them as opposed to people just getting one over on the council and getting two quid's worth of cheap electricity. Martin, go ahead. Sorry, I was, I was trying to raise a comment and I think I was late putting my hand up, but right. on your previous uh, document, there were several items which actually have been superseded because of the big increase in battery capacity available in vehicles, yep. which we, yep. didn't, we didn't expect to happen in 2017-18 when we wrote the last document. So we didn't envisage that there'd be a large number of cars which couldn't charge within an hour on a rapid charger, a 50 kilowatt rapid charger. And that in 2018, that was true, but it no longer is. And we, you know, it wasn't a wrong thing to estimate. It's just things have changed that we weren't aware of at the time. Yeah, fair point, Martin. Jonathan? Martin must have been reading my mind. It, that's what I thought when you're going through that. Um, I mean, back in 2018, if we spoke about an EV doing 120 miles range, we would have gone, oh my word, that is amazing. You know, I can't say increasing much. And now, you know, for those that have got e Eros, 260, 270, 300 miles, if you drive like your granny, is possible with an e Nero. So I think that will have changed people's habits on public charging because like me I, I can't remember the last time I charged 100% because I just charge it when it's cheap or when the sun's out and I think there is this massive range anxiety with new owners that, that scream and stamp and shout and say we need more public chargers on every street corner but the reality is once they've been in their 250 mile range EV they realise it's a non-issue so there's, there's this constant balancing act between expensive infrastructure and people's actual needs. And that graph is just brilliant Neil, because it shows what happens when they weren't getting a free lunch. Yeah. And like you said, you know, the uptake of EVs has, has carried on, carried on a pace. So it's, I think that the change in the average kilowatt hour capacity of EVs has had a massive shift in, in, in how we approach infrastructure. I'd agree with that, Laura. Yeah, I just want to follow on from Jonathan, particularly almost to ask back, because I mean, you know a lot of people, Jonathan, you've got a lot of experience. And I was wondering whether you felt there's been a, a what the behaviour was of people who can't charge at home and their relationship to public charges and how that how that might be changing, given the fact you've got increased because you've got a, a longer range. You've also often got a longer time it takes to actually charge the battery sometimes as well. 
Doesn't yeah, I, sorry, I thought Laura was asking the question of me. Um, well, I was, I'll, I'll ask the question of anyone who has any kind of like, you know, I was thinking of Jonathan, but also Martin, just jump in, because I think it's, it's that, you know, it seems like we're going to have different groups of segment, different kinds of people are going to be using charges in different ways. So if I could just dive in very quickly, my neighbour across the road has a home charger fitted. I won't name his name because he's a lovely neighbour. He's got an e Nero. His wife works at the hospital. He quite happily told me the other day he's done 5,000 miles in his e Nero. He's not plugged it in at home once. And that's because the charge at the hospital is still free. And that just backs up people's behaviour when all of all these charges were free. We see on the graph what, what people do. Yeah. So I think having no, having charging for charging is vital. But where it's free, people will go out their way to fill up for free, no matter how long it takes. <laughs> Martin, do you want to answer Laura's question? Again? Well, well, my, my comment was going to be with the longer range cars, the, the best option is probably people plugging in uh, a slower AC charge point at tea time and picking it up at breakfast time the day after. And that's why we were campaigning with OIC to stop the overstay, overstay charges overnight, because we think that would enable people with longer range cars to just charge up you can get 70 kilowatt hours that's a good 200 miles range from one overnight charge on on some of these longer range cars so so, so, the, so in your case lauren the, the suggestion would be that there would be a charge like the yeah. there would be a convenient car park that you would use once or twice a week sort of thing leave it there overnight and charge it and that would sort of do you rather than try and put a charge Absolutely. And I think Stuart um, also had this, and Stuart Gray had a similar idea. He posted that. And I, uh, you know, it seems to me there's um, that, that kind of thing would be really good as a short term solution. It should, in theory, it should be really relatively, I don't know, there'll be a back end to sort. Um, but also links to my other, so fantastic idea, thumbs up. I like simple, to, simple solutions are good. Um, another thing that struck me was that maybe um, when you're looking at developing the next strategy and maybe either thinking about all the things that are on the, the jam board or things you've talked about now, Neil, whether we want to come up with like the top five or top 10 things we think are most urgent to address, um, you know, because there's still some things that are going to be pushed harder than others. That's at some point yeah. something that might be worth doing. Okay. Gareth and Jonathan. Yeah, so uh, I, I definitely support the idea. Of... Oh. Yeah, got you. Oh, sorry, that was our server just going off, I think. So um, okay. you... St still got you. Okay. Um, yeah, um, it was the idea of signposting charges as well. Um, you know, one of the, I know there's apps and I know you can look at a computer, but if you look at everything else that's around driving, it, you get signposts as to stations, to public toilet, to whatever. <clears throat> could we take on, I don't know if anybody else is doing this, but could we take on devising a signposting system, which we could obviously trial here, <laughs> To, to let people know where the nearest charges are, and it doesn't have to be every charger, but just enough infrastructure. <clears throat> and we've long thought that if, you know, when you're driving from Edinburgh um, or Aberdeen northwards, the last place on the signpost is Thurso, um, and then it shows a ferry. Maybe we could start to own the electrical infrastructure signing by actually showing that, you know, the routes to Orkney have this and that on it. And it could be something that, you know, could be a, a PR boon for the tourist industry as well. But I, I do think we need signposts when you're close to infrastructure to show you which way to go. Okay, all right, back here. Jonathan? Uh, continuous link to signposts. Uh, whenever I hear people UK wide saying, you know, the grid won't cope, there's not enough charges, it won't work. I just say, well, look at Norway. And then they have like 60, 70% of their cars last in the last six months were all electric. <clears throat> and you and McTurk's done an amazing video when he went around Oslo. And it must have been something like 80% of the EVs he saw parked on the street, not plugged in. And these were the early range EVs. So, he, okay, it's a city. But it, again, it's this human behaviour thing that people perceive they've got to be anxious and they need a charger. But the reality is on a massive scale, that people so slowly get used to the fact that oh, yeah, I've only got 20% in the battery, but I only need to do 15 miles tomorrow, so I'll be fine. So it's, I always like to point to Norway, because I think they're about five, six years ahead of where we are now. 
and they're and they're coping with massive EV numbers with their current infrastructure. Thanks. Thanks, John. Okay. Okay, I'm going to rattle on to a couple of little bits and pieces here. Just I'll finish this point off. Um, the the bit with charging and recharging are several bits in it. We Martin particularly did a lot of work on setting the fees for this very sensitively. So different costs for char for rapids and non-rapids, making sure that the fees were set enough to deter people from charging publicly if they could charge at home, but also not set at a level um, that would penalise people who don't have off-road parking and charging themselves. So that was a real a careful piece of work that was done. But the problem is that the fees recover the revenue cost, but don't cover the maintenance cost on the charges at the moment at the volumes that we're seeing um, and um, it is necessary to get better implementation of traffic orders as was said i.e taking away or, or enabling people to leave their cars on a non-rapid charger overnight would actually allow people to charge uh, more effectively so one of the pieces that was in there in the list of things that didn't actually get adopted um, was a bit about the island charging because i think there is a piece here that we did get some um concern expressed by people when we put the last version of the of the um strategy out um, about whether we were treating people on the aisles um uh, differently i just wanted to just show a couple of little pieces that i, I hope um indicate a way that would probably proceed and the point is that the these are the maximum distances that you can effectively do in a journey on the various aisles, um, showing the sort of return routes from um, from basically generally a circuit round Rousey or going from the pier to somewhere. Um, and the main point is that the longest distance that I could find was about 40 miles um, on Hoy going from Monas to, to Canty. Um, and the point is that's about 10 kilowatt hours of electricity. And the point there is that um that the delivery of 10 kilowatt hours is really best suited to a domestic um style of charger than it is necessarily say to a rapid which would chuck 150 kilowatts at you um in in rapid order because most cars wouldn't take that very easily um and indeed they're, they're very expensive chargers and the the point being that there is actually a, an opportunity here um that that could be lost and the risk is in, to my mind is that um, on many of the aisles, the model that may best suit getting the most EV infrastructure out would actually be enabling houses and um, accommodation providers to have domestic style chargers um, on their houses and in various locations, some public charging, but probably not very much. And the point is that a, a rapid charger will cost about fifty thousand pounds to install. A post charger, a sort of a, a, a non-rapid, will be about so seventeen, eighteen thousand pounds to install. Certainly, strong less, plus the cost of getting it out elsewhere. And the point is that domestic chargers will probably come in at around about a thousand pounds each. So one could effectively put fifty domestic chargers onto an island for the cost of one rapid. And indeed, the, the network might not easily take the rapid. So I, I think we need to be very careful that we don't suggest that th there has to be perfect equity and everybody has to have a rapid charger on every island because that would be frankly counterproductive and you could do a lot better by providing sufficient charging infrastructure but the point is we've got to work out what's right for each of the aisles and i think the the the, the main piece that i'd like to do or we'll get out of this consultation process is making sure that we find people on the aisles who drive evs who understand what they will actually need taking jonathan's point about people being petrified they're going to run out of charge until you learn you don't find people on the aisles and work out what's the best model for each of the islands and i think we need to recognize that each island will be slightly different but will probably fall into one or two categories um, so anyway the point was the island model was not something that was specifically adopted by the council last time but i do think it would be sensible that we're going to have to see the electrification of the aisles in the next five years or so and in which case we need to make sure we're doing it the right way and don't just throw very big and expensive charges um, on aisles in in locations which seem to be a good idea superficially but actually are counterproductive um so the gareth sorry go ahead yeah so i was just digesting what you were saying there neil and, and um 
like you, you, it was a great quote, you know, about the, the cost of the charges. And the, the other analogy that you should build into that is, you know, the cost of charges as opposed to the vehicles that are going to be using them. So, you know, if, if you're saying across some of these islands, you know, there might only be two or 300 households, um, you know, it's within the reach of the finance of the cars that are going to be bought, you know, to put charges into all of those households or very close to it. So, you know, something like that, that was a, you know, a strategic ambition to connect up the islands. Um, yeah. You know, that, that seems an eminently sensible thing to do and it's it very affordable. And, and, and it, it's probably something that we take some working through. Oh, sorry, Evelyn, sorry, you got your hand. I'll just finish this point and I'll come to you. Um, it feels only possible to work through that rather than put, you know, a 20 grand charger out on an aisle to put in one or two simple domestic style ones, like the ones we put in a reflex at a couple of thousand pounds, and put 18 or so other chargers around in, on private homes, but with a degree of public access if the need arose, would probably serve the aisles better and help that electrification take place. Because there's a, there is another aspect on aisles charging, which I think we should possibly um, uh, remember. And that is that it is quite likely that some of the older EVs may find themselves migrating towards the aisles. In other words, the shorter range that we'll see on some of the EVs may actually be better suited to some of the aisles. And we may find that they, you know, they, they effectively end up with aisles electric cars. Um, so we may end up with vehicles out there with shorter ranges. Now, I'm not saying that's exclusively the case, but I can see that, that the market working that way slightly. Um, Evelyn, you had your hand up, and then I'm going to go to Mark afterwards. Evelyn. Yeah, I was going to say that also on these islands, while um, uh, buses on the mainland haven't necessarily been able to move towards electric vehicles, because the buses in these aisles do tend to be smaller, I think we're going to see the, the move towards them becoming electric much quicker. And already there are a number of islands that do have um, sort of uh, larger vehicles that are sort of acting as buses in these islands. And so the range there isn't, you know, up to 40 miles in a day you're talking about many, many more miles because they're going to be driving constantly, whereas a, a, um, a, a, yeah, a person on their own might not be. Um, so I think that's also important to understand. And I think um, you said it and other people have said it as well. All of the aisles in Orkney are so different and have their own characteristics and have their own um, sort of uh, uh, build of, of who, who is already on the islands so that it's really important to actually engage with those groups to understand what it is that they need. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Completely agree with that, Evelyn. Um, and I think yeah, the, that's reaching into the development trusts and finding a way to find the, the, the motivated and the knowledgeable people within the aisles is, is critical because so that, that, that will make a huge difference in that. Uh, Mark and then Martin. Yeah, Leo, I don't know if we're going to come on to commercial vehicles, but. Um, I think that could be quite a strain on the aisles, and that's why I'm wondering whether we need to think about charges for both commercial and um, private vehicles. It tractors, trucks, trucking companies and things, um, otherwise it's going to take a long time to get them converted because the economics probably just won't work out for the aisles. Uh, so I was going to exclude tractors from this. Um, mm -hmm because um, I think that's something that will come by different routes principally. Um, and in terms of the trucking, I hadn't really thought that through. I wasn't necessarily going to pick at that, so we can, we can think about that. Um, there are aisles based trucking companies. Yeah, but, um, but do we, I suppose the question is, what, what distances do they do? And I think picking up Evelyn's earlier point about buses, doing a data mining exercise to find out what it is they do to work out what we're trying to solve is probably yeah i have to agree with that but they do come to mainland so. yeah okay that's a fair point Thank you don't you. want to waste your time on mainland charging up uh, uh, completely yeah i get that uh, yeah. martin i was just going to make the point that when you're thinking about putting charges on islands um you've got to realize that if the charger breaks you can't nip to the next charger just down the road like you can. In, so if the Kirkwall charger breaks, you can nip to Finstown and get a charger or vice versa. It's only a few miles apart. If you've got a charger that you're relying on in, say, Sunday, if it breaks, you can't nip to the next charger. You've got to, you've got to put in infrastructure 
that provides resilience within that particular island. So if you were going to use a bus on Sandy that was going to regularly run from the pier up and down the island and needed to charge during the day, you would need to ensure that the charging infrastructure was robust, which would be a minimum of two rapid charges. Uh, and that's that's a lot of expense. You might be cheaper just in a bus with a bigger battery that can do the whole day's running and charge up overnight on, on, on an AC supply. Yeah, yeah. okay. All per points worth developing here. Mike, go. Uh, yeah, well, one of the things that's not been mentioned here is the length of time that it takes to charge your car as a visitor somewhere. I'm thinking of going up to Shetland to visit my daughter up there. She doesn't have a she doesn't have a charger. She doesn't run an EV at the moment. Um, and I think there are about two rapids in different places. But in going to Shetland to pay a visit there, I would want to charge on rapids, no matter how few miles I was doing, because you have to stay by the car while you're charging. If you were to go to a seven kilowatt charger somewhere and have to sit there for an entire day while you charge your car up, it's just not going to work. Um, and the same would apply to um, people who can't do uh, their off-road, they're having to use public charger. If somebody lived in a different part of Kirkwall and had to go to Great Western Road uh, and to charge on a, on a fast charger, um, I mean, it's just not going to be viable, is it? Well, I would suggest that, I mean, the, the piece of work that was done by and the last building regulation consultation showed that 84% of Orkney's properties have got off-road parking. So I think the I think that the underlying principle with so much of this is that the people will charge generally where they sleep. That's the that's the likely default. So you're then only having to serve that non eighty the the, the those people not in the eighty four percent. And I'm not saying eighty four percent is a solid number, but let's let's assume, just keep it as a working hypothesis for the minute that the sixteen percent of the of, of the people who will then have not have the opportunity for off-road parking will need some other solution of those some of those people will charge at work some of those people will charge on public charging but the numbers you're getting down to are in the sort of the 10 percent of the population as opposed to trying to provide public charges for 90 percent and i think once we understand the the likely demographic shift or demographic profile of charging then i think that's going to influence a lot about how we go if we don't do charging at home then you're going to need a lot more rapids to, to, get, to get people through the infrastructure faster. So I, I think we need to, to make sure we properly understand what, what we need. I'd also suggest that probably our needs and Shetland's needs can be very different because you know it's a long way from the airport um, to, in, into town in, in Shetland, whereas our airport is four miles away over the hill. You know, so I, I think we, we need to recognize that there will be different. There will be different um, needs at different areas. Well, we've got a Dalek to join the room. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, I was just thinking more about the visitors, and we, we spoke about the aisles. And if somebody was considering a holiday in Sandy, for example, and they were going to want to take their own car, an EV, while they did self catering, um, now that self catering ideally would have a charger that they could use overnight. Yes. But when you're examining that as a potential tourist, um, that's something you're going to have to look for. So that would be a good thing if every if every self catering had one. But you're also going to be looking for somewhere that you can charge quickly. Um, uh, well, I would argue that the self catering, that the overnight charging, is the main one, and you need less about the the rapid charging because I think people are not going to generally want to want to lose their holiday standing by a charge at rapid or otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Laura and then Jonathan. Um, yeah, just um, wanted to ask someone to double check the 84% figure, just because um, I have off-road parking, it's just my off-road parking is nowhere near my house. Um, and uh, that's not uncommon in Stromness and Kirkwall. Uh, so it's the, just to kind of like say, it's, it's it, you know, the, the, that, that percentage might belie some interesting complexity, which Orkney yeah. and Stromness and Kirkwall have. Yeah. Completely agree. Okay, fair point. Jonathan and then Gareth. Uh, so briefly, I mean, no one's touched on the point of my, one of my favourite words is the granny cable. A lot of EV owners tend to be quite uh, uh, clever in going, well, I'll, I'll book a, 
you know, a nice cottage in the middle of nowhere and I can park close to the back window and I can plug in overnight and they're sort of sort of like that. It's not ideal, but it's okay for a temporary measure to charge up overnight. And Laura's point, very valid, strong mess is awful for destination charging because of the makeup of uh, strong mess. But again, I just keep banging on about Ewan's video about Oslo. Massively, heavily built up place where I can't remember the percentage, but a high percentage can't park anywhere near their houses. And yet EV take up there has just uh, just gone through the roof. So humans find a way of working out these problems. And again, ways just a case in point where it's actually happened. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Gareth? You again. Sorry, I was going to say granny cables, but Jonathan's taught me well there, so thank you. Um, and then um, the other point, going back to Mike's, was, you know, I think all of us, when you think of the aisles, and it actually goes back to Evelyn's point about different aisles have different places. When you think about when you go and visit any of the islands, there's certain places where you're going to stay for longer. And some of that might be a walk destination, you know, Noop Head might be the longest place you go to, or, you know, somewhere else that's going to be a tomb or whatever. So I think the strategy should at least um, highlight that you, you need to look at where people are going to be staying for a length of time and it's back to how long it's going to be to get a reasonable charge and if there's a place where you're going to be an hour if that can give you a reasonable couple of miles more on your on your um, demand then go for that but if it's not then if you're only going to be there for 10 minutes then don't bother with that place so I, I would argue that it's probably I think you need to look back further from that still and that was where did you last charge and if you go to Noop Head, do you need to charge at Noop Head? And the answer is no, probably not, because you charged it overnight when you're at your accommodation. Absolutely. Or, you or you arrived on the island having driven five miles to the ferry to get on it to go to Westry to have the day trip. So you're still in your 250 mile range EV. So I, I, I think we've got to be careful. We don't try and put charges in all these remote destinations because trying to get the grid there could be a challenge and the utilisation be quite low. The risk of vandalism is quite high and the maintenance will be quite high. So I think we need to recognise the, 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 the likely whole, whole process that's around that. Martin? Yeah. Um, the data that you showed earlier, Neil, showing how the uh, charge uses were dropped when we brought in charging, what they didn't show was the number of charges which had extremely low usage and there was a small handful of uh, charges in Orkney that are probably used less than 10 times a year but that we already have. Um, and the, the care home in St Margaret's Hope and uh, St Ronald's House care home in Kirkwall, uh, two of them, I think there was a third one as well, uh, that's less than 10, 10 uses a year. And that, that just does not make any economic sense. 10 uses at the price we charge doesn't even cover half the standing charge for having an electricity supply for those charges, never mind about paying for the electricity and all the other costs that come with it. So we, we've got to make sure that where we're putting in uh, things which are expensive that we, and, 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 and are looking to get a, a, a cost recovery, that we make sure that we get a reasonable amount of usage with each one. And the figure I came up with was two charges of 10 kilowatt hours per day across a whole year. That's the sort of figure that you need to be looking at to start paying off your, your costs. And if we're looking at putting them in, in places that can't do that, then we're looking at identifying before we even put them in, what the long-term subsidy regime is going to be to keep those charges running in the future. Okay. Um, um, Mike, it's 20 past eight, so I'm just gonna move on to a couple of bits in the end, but carry on. Just, just very quickly, and, and it doesn't change Martin's point, but uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I was visiting St. Ronald's House regularly and would have loved to have charged there, but most of the time the charger was iced or it wasn't working. So, I mean, the usage figure there would obviously very, be very low. Yeah, fair point. So. Okay, um, 
I can't watch the rest of it in my slides here. Give me a minute, I'll just work it out. Um, so the, the island, so that's been a useful discussion around that and there's a piece of work to be done there to make sure we get the right model for all that. Um, there's a couple of bits that are coming in terms of the policy side of things, just getting towards the end. Um, there was a bit really about seeking to make sure that in a minute, um, we, we need to make sure that planning fully enables um, charging to take place. Um, at the moment, uh, domestic charges are, are a permitted development um, activity, um, but the, that permitted development right doesn't necessarily apply in the national scenic area. So the, we need to make sure that planning doesn't inadvertently obstruct the process of, of putting charges in. Um, we need to make sure that the building regs, um, which have there's been a, um, a draft of them issued, we're waiting to see them finally come out, but we make sure that the building regs are done that are uh, that the the recommendations within the building rates are properly followed through. Um, that photograph is just a, a case in point of showing the drawback of putting uh, charges at back of path rather than curbside, because uh, you end up with tri trip hazards and cables and stuff. And we've got to be careful we don't build that sort of stuff in by accident. Um, and also, we need to do that the, um, define the level of park public provision i.e. what are we going to do about off-road parking, how much off-road parking is there going to be, and that's a process that I think we have to evolve and get somewhere, but we're trying to work out what is absolutely necessary, and you know, Martin's test of two by 10 kilowatt hours per day sort of thing would be a quite an interesting benchmark to actually uh, measure things against. And then finally, the bit about the control and the enforcement, you need that bit fine tuning. So we need to be able to park overnight at school place or wherever, and we need to make sure you don't have to rush out halfway through your shift to go and shift your, to move your car. Um, so that just needs a bit of common sense applying. Um, and then finally, the other piece is, you know, where is this going to go? And the point is that most public charging is likely to be privately provided in eventually at some stage. It's unlikely the council are going to continue to provide this as a, as a, as a service uh, long term. So the bits I was saying are probably out of scope for the for the strategy. Gareth, go. Yeah, can we just make sure that the policy reflects the off island links as well as the island links if we're going to be successful? Um, so we, we, we did put, yes, we could do something in that. Basically, that's about Transport Scotland need to sort that bit out. because but, yeah, but our policy leaders need to be actively engaged in off island capacity. Let's put it like that. Yes, except I, I think we will struggle to find anybody to take that on. Okay. Because because it, it's basically passing through other people's council areas and they don't care that much. So, <laughs> um, but you know that's a, okay. another point. Okay, but this we do have something in it, but we'll make sure that we don't lose that because it's the getting people to and from Orkney is is, is important as well. Um, so the bits we're saying out of scope for the for the for this um, strategy. Um, said agricultural vehicles, so I don't think we can really cater to that because that's a that's a separate model that's going to evolve in one way or other. They may become hydrogen or ammonia or electric or something, and I think we could waste a lot of time trying to enable that. I think that will happen by a parallel track, which will converge at some point. Um, the ferries, I think that should be out of scope of this strategy itself, because this is about the electric vehicles, even though ferries will probably be significant electrified in due course. Um, the electric aircraft, but I think we can consider the impact of those, i.e. charging on ferries or ch car clubs at transport interchanges or at the airport car park. So I'm not saying we ignore airports, but we don't try, try and include aircraft in, 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 its whole, in this particular strategy that we dealt with by others. Um, and things like the um, what's going to be happening about other EVs on farms, be they um, ATVs or robots or, or, or whatever's going to be happening. I think we, we keep it off that lot. So the point is, it's the set of keep it to about half past eight, and we've had a good chat already, but there are, um, we are getting to time. But the point is, if people have got other ideas they want to put up on the post-its about things that we um, haven't thought of or things that we need to do to enable the future <clears throat> it'd be really useful to capture any of those now so if people want to stick around and carry on with this they will up we'll come back to that but what i'm going to do is do a summing up first and then and then if people want to stick around and put some stuff on they can do i'll just explain what the next steps are going to be 
So the, the next steps are really, we're gonna collect and collate the comments we've had from today and I've scribbled a load of notes as well as the post-it bits we'll have got. Um, and we need to then draft up some proposals what we're gonna to do to the new strategy. So it would be really useful if people uh, were interested in volunteering to get involved in that. And, and if you are, please, please, please do um, uh, email um, either ev at orf.co.uk or, um, or, or Francis at the office, that'd be great. Um, we will then collect together all the thoughts and put the draft up and post that for comment and see what uh, people think about the, the draft we come up with. And then this time I'd like to seek to try and offer it to the council for actually adoption, because I do think there are one or two items within here which would be useful if the council actually um, committed to, to take on. Um, and it will be useful to try and get uh, more structural buy-in than, than we managed last time. Um, and then really to help and then yeah, help Orkney really deliver on the actions because there are a number of things that we can do um, and we all work for companies or know people who can help deliver those actions. So those are principally the, 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 the main steps. And I want to say you know, thanks for your, your time tonight and all this lot. Um, before we go back to the other, the Jamboard piece, I would also um, uh, like to say that, I'd like to say something that I've written on a piece of paper which I've now lost, which is really inconvenient. Bugger, what was that going to be? There was something really important I was going to say. Damn, it's gone. Um, RF membership was one. And this, oh, completely gone. Never mind, it's, it'll, it'll come back to me too late, unfortunately. Gareth, go. Yeah, we still can't lip read. Somebody else is switching off all the time. So, yeah, I was just going to give you some thinking time just to say an absolute many, many thanks, Neil, for pulling this together with, you know, the help from people, because that was a stunning way to take us through quite a complicated strategy. And, you know, it was just brilliant. So, yeah, a tour de force <laughs> and an example of how we should do it in in ORF in the future. So really well done. It's fantastic. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Gareth. That's very kind of you to say so. Thank you. Um, well, it, it makes it a lot easier that people actually bother to uh, to turn out because to sit here talking to yourself is really not the best thing to do of an evening as well. Mike, go. Oh, I'm just applauding you. Oh, we see. <laughs> thank you, Richard. <Richard-D. laughs> you flick your hand up and down, up and down very slowly. It's a very slow, slow hand clap. I'm not sure I like that. Is that what it is? <laughs> Anyway, um, right, so just going back to the, uh, the stop the share, if people were to look at the, the jam board that they should still have got up, which mine's disappeared. Oh, there we go. Um, so um, with the EV, strategy we, so we, we've got a bunch of bits and pieces that are up here we'll we'll post up if we talk about if we talk about the random stuff at the end for a second I'll cover that um does anybody want to speak to any of these particular points uh, the the i like the random point about let's get rid of the um uh the petrol generators uh, uh for the burger vans um I have put a proposal in to the council about that some time ago, but that, that hasn't really happened. I've spoken to four of the burger vans and they'd all be in favour of doing that as well. It cost them a bloody fortune. So, we'll, we'll, yeah, should we, we, we'll put this as a footnote in the EV strategy so somehow. That feels like a thing. Um, Multi-lead charge points, four car charges. Could somebody speak to that? I'm not quite sure what that means. Sorry, it's me. Uh, Am I on? No, I'm not on mute this time. Um, it was basically that if you think of the, you know, parking spaces, you know, the maximum number of cars you can put around a charger is four easily. But, you know, why don't we have chargers where you can plug in four cars and the charger thinks about which one it's going to charge next? Or if you're doing the overnight charging, you, you know, instead of having one charger doing one car, have one charger doing four cars and, and it gets it by, you know, the morning. So it was, that was the idea. And that was a part of what we were seeking to do with the reflex charges at the old academy. Um, but yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a fair point, Gareth. We'll, we'll pick up on that. You have to obviously have them in the space between four 
you know, your, your parking layout has to reflect that strategy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so what else we got here? Selling electricity is restricted by law to cost price unless licensed seller you need to find some way to allow people to sell um, to cover costs of infrastructure. Uh, I don't think that's true, Neil, to be honest. No, I don't. No, no I don't. Does, does somebody want to defend that? Because I, I know that you that the rates that the, ch the people charge for electricity is very much set by the, um, by the post owner. Um, that was me. Um, the, re, the law says you cannot sell a unit of electricity for more than it costs you. Um, that's actually put in place because of residential landlords. Um, uh, unless you have a license to do it. So I presume that's what Charge Place Scotland have got. No. Don't think they have. And they're, they're not a licensed electricity supplier. Yeah, because it, I, I think you'll find it's the host that's selling the electricity. I'm sure that, uh, yeah. I, I, Certainly, if you've, got, if you've got a residential place, you're not allowed to charge any more than it costs you to buy it per unit. Yeah, that, that, that was for residential domestic properties. Um, like, yeah, so if you like, had a, rent, like a rented flat, if you if you have a house and rent out flats in it, that's all it applies to. You sure? Okay. Yep. And so I know sure. Piccadilly Boo said that was a problem they'd hit with their charges. Yeah, I, I don't think they're right. I, th I think they were badly in, informed, to be honest. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it, you, you'll be able to find out for us anyway, you, Martin. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, I'm pretty sure the rule that applied everywhere no longer does. It's restricted to, to, to quite a tight amount of a, a subset of rented properties. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so uh, what else have we got here? Uh, get, so get planning in principle for charge point locations across the county where, where it would be okay to do so. Um, so uh, that, yeah, that could, well, I, th I think there is actually planning in principle for domestic charges under the GDP, is it not GDPR, is it? P PDR, P Permitted Development Rights. It's just that that permitted development right, I don't think applies within the National Scenic Area. So I, th I think there is actually planning in principle or effectively planning in principle for for charges on houses um, already. Um, that was still the other one. That was my one again. It was really maybe in the in the scenic area. Then, is it worthwhile, you know, <laughs> or, or or somebody doing a job to kind of say where would be sensible to do it so that so so the suggestion is that actually we could seek to try and get this within the local plan. Yeah. So, so effectively, you'd have a sort of a relaxation within the National Scenic Area, unless it's in the conservation area or it's a listed building. So, so we're not doing a piece of work at the moment to, to, to come up with a draft plan for Stromness, for example. So that should be something that comes into that. Yeah, could we, could we, could we brought in? So let's, let's see how yeah, okay, so we can do that. Okay. Um, it's a whole bunch of pieces. Gamification of the behavioural change. That's got to be Laura who wrote that. Um, I we can use something like Hive or Nest to start or stop charges, which removes some effort. We often use the CPS app to start and stop charges. Um, anyone want to speak to that? Yeah, that was my one. It's a oh, definitely. There you go. Here, right. sorry, my I was just in a noisy household. Yeah, it was just you know the use of software and kind of smart homes. <laughs> if we ever do eventually get a smart charger rollout, you know we were talking earlier about you know physically plugging in a vehicle when we're going to get paid, you know to to charge the grid etc. But you know, can we do that in a in a soft manner? And you know some of the existing infrastructure there is actually very good. You know we've used the the CPS app to start and stop charges when we're on and off islands and various things like that so um yeah just just integrating 
smarter choices, I suppose. Yeah, okay, right. Just it's worth, worth looking at. Um, and there's the one here, it'd be good if charging was registered with the car so you could plug in anywhere without a card or app and you could automatically charge in your normal electricity bill. Um, yeah, the, I, I think the I think the challenge there at the moment is the lack of communication between the car and the charger, unless it's a rapid. Um, but I, I entirely see the point that it's the car that needs the charge, not the person driving it. So uh, I, there's, there's, there's definitely a, a point to possibly see a look at whether the count, whether we can do anything specifically here, or whether that becomes a um, a potential project to look at. We can see. Um, I was also going to look at what else we got on the board. Nothing in page five, nothing in page six. So it's people experimenting and putting new pages up. Um, it's, it's now coming up on 20 to nine. So I'm inclined to draw this to a close at the moment, unless people wanted to pick on any particular points they, they don't feel have been thoroughly aired at the moment. Gareth, I'm going to cut your bloody hand off if you put your hand up again. Well, Jonathan, <laughs> go on then. Jonathan. Um, yeah, what about getting micro turbine operators to have charges associated with their turbines? Would that give them the option of direct sales opportunities? I'm thinking particularly in the aisles, there's a lot of turbines that are up by houses. Would, yeah. Would they be ah. able to? I, I don't know about that, but it, you have now reminded me what, what the thing was that I was going to mention, which is really important. So thank you for that. That's really helpful. You triggered that thought. So we've had an approach, and people may have seen it's been posted extensively on Facebook. A French TV company want to film um, uh, an Orkney household who's basically got an EV um, and microgen of one type or another. Um, if you are in that uh, lucky position and you're willing to have a French TV company uh, wandering around and, um, uh, and, and talking to you and asking you intelligent questions, could you please um, let me know because it'd be really useful because we could do with some volunteers. So we've, um, we've used uh, Steve Sankey in the past and I know Jonathan has got a long list of people who trampled through his house looking at his cupboards. Um, uh, and the drug squad, that's another story. Um, and, um, uh, but if you do have, uh, if you have got microgen and, uh, and a car, it would be really useful to know so that we can um, possibly put people your way. Um, Jonathan, and then I'll take it out because you reacted to that. I think that oh, yeah. I don't makes a really good point. Um, not that I'm bragging in any way, but when I'm out and if everything, all my batteries are full in the house, I text my neighbour. I say, quick, go plug into my charger because everything's getting docked on the grid. So there is that, I think in the future, there will be that almost community spirit, particularly amongst EV anoraks and nerds like us, is that, uh, you know, it, it pains us to see grid electricity, our own electricity, our own in inverted commas, going to, going to waste on the grid. So there is that EV thing where we just invite our neighbours and our friends to, to come in and that can be controlled via an app so lots yeah. of exciting possibilities in the future okay um adele yeah just one point i raised in the chat about you know the cost of electricity i think for the general householder who's not lucky enough to have a micro gen you know looking into tariff costs for electricity this year and beyond, you know, we're getting quoted upwards of 45p a kilowatt hour. And that, that's kind of mid-range potentially, uh, particularly if you want to stay on a, on a green tariff. So if we were paying 45p a kilowatt hour at home, but the public charges were still 10p, would we then see a Mac, uh, an exodus back onto public charging? Or is that a way to kind of bridge, you know, additional costs? Because certainly for our household, the way that we factored in, you know, getting an electric vehicle, we went from two cars to one, and then we factored in the, the lifetime cost of the vehicle, including the fuel cost. So when Jonathan does things like, this is how much it costs for X number of miles, you know, if we're tripling or quadrupling the cost of energy, then we're kind of eating into that capital cost of the vehicle, which, you know, which is difficult to balance out making the decision then to go for an electric vehicle. You know, it might be a short-term spike, 
in costs, um, but it's just worth considering, I think. Um, yeah, it's fair point. Impact. Fair point, Adele. It would be, a, it'd be remiss not to reference that, wouldn't it? Fair point. Okay. Has anybody got anything else burning that they want to say right now? Because if not, I'm going to close this up and say thank you all very, very much for your uh, participation. Well, I've got two hands were raised. No, your hand is still up. Are you still got another point? Were you, are you done? Okay, thanks. All right. So uh, I'll just say thanks, Rishni, for your participation tonight. That's been, um, uh, I found it really interesting um, and it's been a, a good to explore things. It's also good to have some degree of corroboration of the stuff that we um, put in, the effort we put in a few years ago it seemed to be largely on the right track. And what I'm hearing tonight is there's a need to better develop some ideas and finesse some ideas rather than the fact we're fundamentally pointing in the wrong direction. We've missed something massive. Um, there are things that are coming to, within our site um, and it, it looks uh, really quite exciting. Um, so I'm going to say thank you all very much indeed for... Jonathan, are you waving goodbye or signalling? So. I'm saying, Neil, I don't know how you can talk for an hour and a half, hour and three quarters, and make it so engaging. So well done, my friend. You've done a fantastic job tonight. Just backing up what Gareth said earlier. Thank you, Richard. You, you want to tell Debbie that? Right. <laughs> so anyway, another story. Right, so look, thanks all very much indeed for your time tonight. Really appreciate that. That's, that's, been, uh, that's been a comparatively um, entertaining evening. You're right, I do need to get out more. Right, okay. So, uh, good night, everybody. So, uh, see you on a small screen somewhere soon. Right, take it easy. Bye, all. <laughs>